Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for session two of the M1 Accelerator series. This one we titled, Am I Overbought or Over-Inventoried? Sounds very redundant, but there's actually key differences in those two statements. So for session two, we decided to double our panelists and we invited the esteemed Mr. Paul Erickson, Director of Mentorship here at Management One, and Mike Taylor, long-term retail expert and trainer here at Management One to help us kind of decipher what are the differences and how do we spot the impact of the two of them. Uh, before we get into that, though, and thank you for joining us today, gentlemen, I did want to get into just a little bit of housekeeping with the call. So this is a live webinar, and the reason we did this one live as opposed to pre-recorded is questions. We really want to hear from you, the audience, after the presentation or even during Feel free to click down below the, the Q&A button there and submit us your questions. We're happy to answer them live on this panel. The question that we get the most is, are you recording this? And 100% yes, we do realize that people have busy schedules. So if you do need to drop off early, we will absolutely send a recording after this. So the M1 Accelerator series, we designed this really as an exclusive series specifically for indie retailers. And our goal is to really teach you how to dive deeper into the metrics within your retail business and how to use those tools that we have available to our clients to dig as deep as they possibly can to find new opportunities, take quick action. Here at Management One, we have a concept that we call fail fast. And we can discuss what that means a little bit later, but how can we really use these metrics to better our decision-making and move our businesses forward? So session two is all about overstocked versus overbought. Now session three in December, coming up on December 12th, it's a bit of an extension of that. So we're gonna be talking about balancing categories based on consumer demand. And I will have an email link out to everyone to register for that one as well. But without further ado, I will turn it over to the experts. Paul, the stage is yours. Sir. Thank you, Nico. And uh, hello, everybody. It's uh, exciting to have the number two session in our on, on our new ongoing series, uh, accelerator series, teaching, you know, how to use your data, how to use your, your, um, your management one retail orbit reports to get results. And it is my absolute pleasure to share the stage today with my good friend, Mike Taylor, uh, today. So Mike, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Glad to be here, Paul. You know, I think when, when a lot of our clients review their plans and they look at their merchandise plans, um, they undoubtedly run across certain classifications that I would say appear problematic for a variety of reasons. Uh, and the two typical areas of concern that they have is those big negatives under the first first month. And what does that really say? Is it, am I overbought because I have a huge negative? Am I overstocked? Is a combination of the two? Um, and, and so one of the things we wanna do over the next 30 minutes is to try to maybe clear up some kind of confusion on that. The first thing I wanna start out with is that being overstocked uh, and being overbought are two completely different problems, although they tend to share potentially similar, similar result, bad results for our clients, right, Mike? Yeah, they are different problems, but like you said, they share the same result almost always. And unfortunately, that result is almost always negative. You know, it's uh, when you have too much, when you carry too much inventory, it's really going to kill your cash flow or cause cash flow challenges. It's going to reduce your profits. And your store is just not going to realize its true potential. Yeah. I I, I tell that to retailers all the time, Mike. I mean, uh, you know, let's let's talk about being overstocked for a second. Uh, which is generally speaking, I think, Mike, and I think you would agree with me, that's generally the major cause of a large negative in the open to buy at the bottom of their reports. Uh and like, and also, as you said, um, this is incredibly damaging to your ability to grow your business. And it will eventually be a profit problem as markdowns are inevitable. Uh, 
I always, I told retailers, in fact, I, I, I spoke, I'm in Las Vegas right now, and, and I spoke to uh, a group of retailers here, about 150. And one of the things I told them that is that old inventory is a cancer within their store. And it has the potential to metastasize itself everywhere. And unless you rip out that cancer, you are never, never, ever going to get healthy. Um, now, being overstocked, as opposed to being overbought, one big difference is it doesn't happen overnight. It happens very slowly. It's usually, I call that a slow sort of steady increase in SKUs and styles and brands. And I can go on and on, which usually increase your amount of inventory you carry, but don't really appreciably increase sales. So with that said, uh, let's look at a report. And what we have here is a, one of our management one um, uh, merchandise plans. And it's for women's tops. And one of the things that I want to sh start out with is that we, we see in the inventory, let me get my, we see right here. Do you see this, Mike, what I'm doing right here? Oh, yeah, I can see that. Okay, so right there, we have an issue. Our inventory is at $38,000. Our forecasted plan inventory is at $13,000. And last year, our inventory was at $18,000. We literally have almost $20,000 more inventory than we even did last year, which is a huge problem. Let me just blow that up for a second and show you that. Here we can see, here's another, this is the blow it up a, a bit up further. So what we're looking at here is a problem. And the reason why I know it's a problem is because I can go back and compare that inventory with how much merchandise came in during the month. Here's your receivings during the month right here, Mike. And then let's go yeah. back. Let's go back and we're, this is in August. We go back into July and we received $1,800. And I can go back even further into June, back in time, $4,000. And I can go back pretty far. And you'll see that based on how much came in, the vast majority of that inventory is old and yeah. it's and it's and it is consists what i would say it consists of a whole lot of nothing uh in fact with twenty thousand dollars more inventory i can prove it with all this additional inventory our run rate in sales is forty two hundred dollars which is exactly what we did last year right but we've got twenty thousand dollars more inventory but you know, Paul, those numbers that you just went over really tell us that we have two distinct problems that we're dealing with here. Yep. We have all that extra inventory, which is from the previous season, which in this case would be spring, summer. But we have not fed the system to get uh, our new fall inventory in. So we are, um, uh, and let's look at this from a more visual perspective. Uh, could we put the graph up? Sure. So we took the numbers from the plan. These are nothing but numbers that we took off the plan. And we graphed out in the orange color uh, the spring inventory that we've been carrying. And now we here we are in August. And in the bluish or purple, uh, the fall inventory that's come in. And over to the right, we can see our plan number. And what this graph shows us is that even though we have all this extra inventory, all that extra inventory is from last season and we're not feeding the new season. So we have two distinct problems uh, that we have to deal with with separate set of actions. So here we are, Mike, on 8-1. Let me get, let me just highlight yeah. just it's so important. Here we are on August 1. Typically the kickoff of a new season for most of our clients. And what you're saying is that this is the amount of current inventory here of fall. Yeah. This is how much they still have in, they still have in spring summer that they haven't sold yet. Right. Oh my God. So, you know, we can't confuse the two because dealing with all that extra inventory from the previous season takes one set of actions and skills and plans but we have a completely separate problem. We're starving the current season, and that's a different uh, activity and a different set of actions we need to take to get that fixed. But when yeah. you just look at the composite number, you don't see that. 
That's exactly right. You know, um, actually, in that example, which shows to be overstocked, uh, and that they're really not overstocked. In fact, they're actually underbought, which is a completely different thing. Let me just go back, Mike, to the slide before this. Right. And this is Mike. You may want to go on, but this is this is the same information that we had. But here's their on order. Right. Which is nothing. <laughs> well. We haven't bought what we need to for August. We only have 740 for September. So uh, this is a, a plan on demand and we're 45% in through the month. We have nothing more coming this month and we're thin on the current inventory. We have 740 on order for next month. So we're, we're thin and gonna get thinner by the hour. Right, right. How much should we be bringing in? I mean, how much? I mean, if you look at the open to buy, my God, we still have all this open to buy left to spend, right? Right. Which is down here. Now, again, I think this is where things get confusing. How do we take, how do we react to this 19,000 negative? Well, you know, Paul, one of the things I like to do before I look at a plan is just take a second and get my bearings. And what I mean by that is where are we in the seasons and what would I expect to see? So in August, we're kind of uh, really far into our transition. So how do we know what I should bring in? If, you, if we can go back to the uh, actual plan, you see that it tells us in the uh, net inflow column what we should bring in in new inventory this month. This is right here, Mike, right? This yeah, one, this number right here. Okay. Yeah. So that's our guide. Even though we have all that extra inventory, the plan still tells us what we should have brought in this month. Right. This is important. We're under that, and we have nothing else on order. This is important. And I talk about this a lot with not only our clients, but with our new retail experts. This is the true North Star when you're overstocked, is this section here. Because this is what the right, um, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, Mike, but this is the way I understand it. This is this is what you really should bring in this month yeah. if you were at the right amount of inventory. Huh. If your inventory was spot on, then this is the right flow for this month. And and so they actually aren't far off from that, are they? They're under, but uh, you know our sales are actually over plan. Our trend is over plan. So uh, I would you know. You can be aggressive on a class or you can be uh, defensive. I think this is a place for us to be aggressive. So I would go a little bit over what the plan says. I agree with you too. And the reason why I agree with you is we, let's go back over to what we see happening over the month prior. So the month prior, which I had already highlighted, yeah. we only got in $1,800. Right. The month before that, only 4,300. So we really have yet to catch up. I think what you're saying, Mike, catch up to having the right amount of new season as we set the table uh, for this particular classification uh, going into fall. Yeah. So before we leave this, uh, you know, we, uh, we're not dry. We, our trend right now is we're going to beat the plan by, you know, a good number. Uh, so we're off to a good start. We have good start to the season as far as sales, but we're beginning to starve this class unless we jump on some orders this afternoon. So right. what's the what's the result of not driving aggressively into growth like this or aggressively into the new season? Well, the problem is, is that the customer comes in at the beginning of the season and expects to see all new fall and or spring inventory. And when they come into the store and see that half of the store is still full of sale merchandise from summer, it is tremendously damaging to the image of the store, let alone the financial consequences of what that is going to entail. But Mike, you see this and I see this too. What causes, well, how does a retailer get into this situation? Oh, well, I'm sorry, repeat it. Well, a retailer gets, how did, how did this happen? I mean, oh. what generally happened, do you have a theory? I have a theory on how this kind of happens, which is that, they, that there have, in any retail store, you only have access to so much capital. 
You have exactly. access to the amount of cash flows that your store is producing, and you have access to the amount of money you can borrow from the bank. That is essentially all your or, or Uncle Paul, your rich Uncle Paul, right? That's about it. Yeah. And so at some point when you're tied up your money in inventory that's not selling, if you look at this, for example, let me just add another thing to this whole equation. If you look at the historical inventories here, let me find my pen. Look at this, Mike. Back in June, they had $43,000 of the inventory. Their sales were down and only did $4,200 in sales. Back in May, they had $42,000 of the inventory and only did $3,800 in sales. This is more than 10 to 1 inventory to sales relationship. This is the cause. Their, their assets are all tied up in merchandise that's not selling because it is old and they've been very reluctant to take markdowns for some reason because they're more influenced by profits than they are cash flow. And I well, think this is the cause, my opinion. You know, uh, I think we would agree that there's not an infinite number of dollars that the retailer can spend. So every dollar that you have tied up in non-performing inventory is a dollar you don't have to buy something that would sell tomorrow. Yep. Yep. I agree. Let's look at another one. Let's go. Okay. Let's go. This was good, by the way. Um, so here's a gene. Let's look at this. This is a gene category. And um, maybe you want to get started on this. Take a look. Tell us what we're looking at here. Well, um, we looked at over stocked now overbought or overordered i like to call it um me, that's going to show up let me zoom in okay sorry okay, okay. uh over ordered or uh, overbought is in the future where we're buying more than the plan tells us to buy so these are going to show up as negative open to buy numbers in the future which is what we're seeing down at the bottom here all these big negative numbers is we're habitually have more on order than the plan tells us we're going to need to bring in to drive our sales. Right. And I just, and what that's going to end up in over time is we're going to see an over inventory situation because we're overbought in the future. Yeah. I think if you look at this, for example, where do these negatives come from? Well, one way to look at it is we have an on order right here. Let's just go out, even let's extend it out through July. That on order, I added it up in advance because I always do my homework, as you know, Mike. Uh, I added it up in advance, and that's about $75,000 at retail worth of product coming in. Now, let's just look at something as basic as this. We have $75,000 at retail on order in the same time frame as last year, where we sold in these same four months. That added up to $49,000. So we've got seventy-five dollars coming. Right, I'm going to write that right here. 75 coming in the same time frame that we sell last year, 49. Isn't that the definition of overbuying? Well, I'm going to probably end up playing the foil here, but to me, that looks like uh, um, uh, the classic example of buying more than we can sell is what it on the surface is what it looks like. Is that? correct analysis well that's the way that's the way i would initially look at this and and i think the plan is telling us that with all as you said all these negatives on the bottom okay but can i bring up one thing though that sure. i would disagree sure. with that negative on the bottom okay let's, let's look at and i'm going to extend this all the way out into so we're in march right now so we have an on order and I'm going to get my pen here if I can find it here in just a second. It's kind of a tricky little guy here. There we go. And so if you if you see that we've got 23,000 on order coming in in June, and we have 20, 25,906 coming in in May, and we have 20,000 coming in in April, and we're saying because of these negatives down below, right down here, that we're overbought, correct? Am I understanding mm -hmm. that right? Well, I wanted to give you a different perspective of this. Okay. Let's, look at what we, let's go back in time and look at what we have been selling in jeans. In okay. August this year, we sold 19,000. In September, we sold 22. In October, we sold 28,000. In November, we sold 21,000. In December, we sold 23,000. And that you could say, well, that was fall holiday. But now we're into slow times of the year, January, almost 26,000, and February, 23,000, and January and February alone, you can see these numbers here, Mike, those are the increases. 
we were up $17,000 in just the prior 60 days. So there's a strong trend going on here right now that that and we're pushing through over twenty thousand dollars a month. Now let's see where we're at right now. Our trend right now we're at eleven five eighty two. So we're trending to do sixteen thousand dollars this month. So we're a little bit off that trend right now, but that would tell me that this is not this is maybe a pretty good bet right here. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, let me throw a couple of other numbers at you. Uh, yes. I saw them on the big plan. I don't see them on this page, but uh, let's go back to the big plan. Okay. So last month we beat the plan by almost nine thousand, and okay, we're last... trending over the plan right now. But last month our stock to sales ratio was only one point two five. Okay. Well, let me let me highlight this for everybody on the okay. call. So last month you're saying we did twenty three thousand eight hundred, and our plan was thirty. We almost doubled our plan. Yeah, we almost doubled it. Okay, and what was the next point you were making? Our stock to sales ratio was only 1.25. Oh! So we killed the plan and we're growing like crazy, but our stock to sales ratio went down to 1.25. So looking at those two numbers together, what does that tell you? Oh my God, I didn't even see that. Look at look at the month before, Mike. 32,000 yeah. beginning inventory sold 26. Right. Look at that. Look at how, look at this. Inventory was actually down, and we were down eighteen hundred and eight thousand, and we did seventeen thousand dollars more sales. Okay, this is exciting. <laughs> this is exciting. And what that tells me is that we are selling through everything that we're coming in. We are just blowing it out. Uh, these stock ratios are tremendous, and and we are absolutely in need. Of this, and by the way, we got twenty eight thousand in this month too. I don't know if we made a comment on that as well. Yeah. So, so that tells me that we're selling every every pair of jeans we get in the store. Well, I like to summarize that as the customers love what we're bringing in. We just need to bring in more of it. <laughs> That's exactly right. But I think the point here is 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 an important point. You have to look at more than just one number on these reports. Yeah. You have to look at, at more things. And Mike, that's what you have always uh, said for the, as long as I've known you, that this is this is what we have to do. Okay, let's look at another one. This is fun. Pants. Okay. So let's take this example of pants. So right now, if you just looked at, and again, I'll get my, my market. This little sucker is hard to catch, though. I can tell you that, though. But if you look at... Let me let me blow it up a little bit. Maybe we can see it right here. Okay, so if we look at the set, the inventory, and the inventory of thirty one thousand nine six six, which is right here, you see that? That's mm -hmm. our inventory in pants. And do you see the planned inventory of seventeen thousand nine five seven? Oh my. Okay. That would appear, if we just looked at those two numbers, that would tell us that we have twice as many pants as what we really need and we're very overstocked correct yeah but but based on your theory that we need to look at more information than just that those inventories and all inventories can only be truly evaluated with the sales they produced and so one of the things we're seeing here is that our sales on this particular this month are at 11,000 to date which means our run rate, which is right up here. Do you see this, Mike? Yep. Is $15,600 that we're set, going to be selling, we're, we're trending to sell, and we're well more than halfway through the month that we're trending to do. Now suddenly, that 31000 to sell 15000 16000 or two to one doesn't look so overstocked to me. Yeah, but I love that point and illustration, but uh, why is the planned inventory so low? Then? Well, I think the system hasn't caught up to it yet. Let me go back to the, let me go back to the prior, the, the bigger picture. So when we looked at the pants, if we go up here, we've been doing pretty good business in pants. You see right up here, Mike, 10,000 yeah, yeah. and then 87. And these are all, and by the way, look at this, look at this December. So we, we see this come, this has been coming. It's like a train coming down. So we see it coming. We were $5,000 up in December from last year. We were almost $3,000 up for in January. We were almost $2,000 up in February. Not a good month. 
So we saw that this was starting to happen and we were starting to react to it. But what really is going to blow the socks off of it is in March. The point I'm making is that the system itself hasn't quite caught up. They haven't seen, if we do 15,600, we're going to double last year's sales. Once that is put into the algorithms and the planners see that number, the, sale, the plan sales are going to get back up and we're going to catch up to this trend. But we could we see this coming. We touched on this earlier, but I just want to get your thoughts on this. So we're trending to double what we did last year. We've been up and up and up for four months in a row. How important is it to drive into growth like this? I mean, to, to hit it. Very, very, very important. You know, right now, we're probably under planning this category by 20 to 30%, in my opinion. And so right there, if you see that, you know, what our on order is, you can see that the budget was 8,800 at retail. We've got 77 here. Now, I like this number here. To see this one here? She, that, this is a strong position in May. And yeah. this is a pretty good strong position we have right now. So I think in this case, we're kind of driving into this right now where we have, and we've already received 17,000. We still have another 7,900 coming. So I think this retailer is jumping on this quickly. And what will appear to be an overbought condition is going to completely evaporate next month when we update these plans. Because retail is not, you know, to, retail is a business of fast trends and a very, very quick, and we need to be able to jump on them and then buy the correct amount of inventory for that. You know, Paul, I've always said the most important thing we do is we drive aggressively into growth. Right, right, so. absolutely right. Okay, let's go, let's go, okay, this is kind of fun. Let's go, we got one more to do, okay? This is a little okay. tiny one, this is a little tiny one, this is good. So women's denim classification, you know, it's a smaller store and you see, so we get back here again. So once again, we see, Here's that, here's that inventory. Let's go right to this number again. Again, are we overstocked? Or are we overbought? Uh, and if you look right there, we're not overstocked at all, Mike. We have exactly, our inventory in denim is right where the plan says it should be. $5,100, we're $400. doesn't even count. You see that? Yeah. So would you say that this is pretty much perfect? Well, maybe not. Let's look at the, let's tear that number apart just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we have another graph, I think, uh, to help us explain this number. Let's go forward um, to the graph. Okay, yeah. here we go. So here's our women's denim. Again, we graph the um, season that we're exiting in the orange, and we graph the new season that we're driving into in the purple. And even though our inventory number is almost exactly on the plan, just like you said, if we graph in how much of the inventory we have for the coming season, it's only a fraction of what we need. It's just a pitiful uh, a place that we are relative to what we need. So um, uh, the only real receiving has uh, come this month, I think, in the season. And most of the inventory in here is older than ancient. So yeah, look at that. I mean, that's crazy. Plus, look how it's come down, too. Yeah, on your right. graph. I mean, so it's if inventory to come down, which was as at just back in April at 10,000 and now it's at five. Can you imagine what this inventory looks like? So, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll say this, then we can go back and look at the actual plan. But this shows us that the absolute number, don't take it at face value. You have to look at what that number is, what, right. what that number is composed of. I mean, Mike, look at just look at sales here. I mean, they're just, I mean, for example, you know, again, it's it's not how it's how it's not how much you have, it's how much it sales is producing. So we are finally this month getting some traction. And when I say that, we've done 268. Now it's early in the month, but the trend line, if we continue that up, is 1187, which is pretty good for this inventory. That's only happening because of this receiving right here. You see that? Because if yeah, you go but, back, look at this, Mike. Look at Mike, how much came in, in we're in August. How much came in in July? Not a thing. Look at that. Four hundred dollars came in in June. How much came in in May? How much Nothing. came in? In June? How much came in in April? How much came in in March? How much? Look at. And this is why the inventory. We brought nothing new, and this is why that inventory at ten thousand has shrunken down to five thousand dollars. In fact, it went all the way down to forty six hundred 
here and look at that inventory. Look at what it sold. Look at the sales in May. Seventy-eight hundred dollar inventory sold two hundred. Yeah. Fifty-two hundred. Now the inventory dropped. I don't know, could it be with markdowns or maybe we just sent back to vendor. I don't know. Still lousy inventory. Only did two hundred dollars in sales. So again, this is another example of you cannot just look at the inventory that you have on your reports against what we look at in purple is the optimum level without looking at other information to deem if that inventory is correct, if we're really overbought, underbought, overstocked, understocked, or right at plan. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, again, to kick my dead horse here, um, we have two distinct issues. We have the older inventory that we have to make a plan for. Plus, we have to drive aggressively into this new season. You know, that old inventory, that's the one issue to deal with. But we've also got to get more of the of the denim in the store. Right, right. Of the, of the current denim that we need, yeah. Yeah. So right here, got to start getting it in right here. Here's the flow. And I think... Yep, and if ahead. we had the bottom part, we could see that there's nothing on order for the next two months. Let's go. We do have the bottom part. <laughs> so we, are, we, have, we, have, we have nothing on order for the next two months. And we do. And, and, and Jim Dandy to the rescue, we finally decided to get some, get some denim into the store in October. A little, you know, okay. little bit late. A little bit late. A little bit late. A little bit late. But at least, we're, at least we haven't gotten out of the ball game yet. Okay. Well, let me rephrase that. That's a whole lot, Blake. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. But um, I think, you know, what we really tried to impart today on, on today's accelerator, and, and we're 30 minutes in, and we promised everyone we won't be more than 30 or 40 minutes on these presentations. But I think in summary, um, all the numbers we discussed here, Mike, uh, uh, are on the plan. And when we say the plan, those are the kinds of decisions and the critical thinking that as a client of Management One and using Retail Orbit, um, you need to understand. I, Mike, you, you said it first. You said there's never one number on here that tells the whole story, and that is true. You know, retail is a business of matching up inventory to sales, supply and demand. This is what our business is about. It's the most important part. How much inventory do we have? And if it's the right inventory, it'll do the business. But, you know, it's never one number, and I often say it's a symphony of numbers to use to make better decisions on how you manage uh, your retail business and how to effectively use the reports that you're getting from Management One. Mike, I'll let you wrap it up because that's it for the big talker here. The, the only uh, thing I would add to that is when you're looking at your plans by yourself, don't just look at the numbers. There's a story there. Try to tell yourself the story that you're seeing and not just look at the numbers. Like we were telling a story back and forth. You have to ferret that story out for yourself when you're looking at your plans just by yourself. And you have, if you have a retail expert, let them help you. Or you can always contact any one of us. You can contact Mike or myself or anyone at uh, corporate at Management One, and we'd be happy to go through your numbers and show you maybe opportunities that you're not seeing and what to look at and maybe some things that have been been hampering the, the, your ability to grow your business. Because w what we all want at Management One is for your business to grow. And that's what we're looking for. And Nico, I'm going to turn it back to you. It is your time. I think that uh, that was great. What, what really jumped out to me too is the story is nuanced and in I think you saw in, in one of the examples that you guys showed, it continues to play out the closer you evaluate the numbers on the plan. And it can be a little daunting when the plan is sitting there in your face. It's it's a large grid of numbers. But to the well-trained eye, these stories tend to unfold. And it's not just the one number. We didn't even get into ROI when you start looking at evaluating your inventory levels versus the margins that you're getting off of these and the velocity that they're moving it adds a completely separate layer to the conversation that we definitely don't have time to get into today, but maybe in our next uh, our next Accelerator series next year, we can get into a little bit more of that. Questions. So we did have a couple of questions here. Um, Leanne was asking, is there a number or a percentage that you should be at uh, sales to inventory? It depends. Uh, good question. And uh, it depends on type of business you have. 
So um, let's take a woman's boutique, a fashion store. Generally speaking, we believe, and this is going to be different by store by store, location by location, but as an overall, the studies that have been done have indicated that in women's fashion, uh, approximately a 10-week supply is optimum. In other words, you want to replace your inventory about every about five times a year. And so, um, and, and certainly if you consider that there are four seasons in a calendar year, then, and you're in a seasonal business, then I would suggest that a three-month supply or a four-time turn would be probably optimum. But that can be different. A shoe store is going to need more inventory to sales because of size uh, situations. And so everything, everything is going to be dependent, I think, there on the type of store you have and your location and the amount of business you do, too, which is also uh, very important. I was on a call uh, this morning with one of our larger clients, and they have a number of stores, and their stores have a large variance in sales per square foot. And one of the things that the, uh, that the CFO told me this morning was, look, we've got these small stores that are doing over $1,000 a square foot. We can't hold much merchandise in those stores, and thus our plans need to reflect that by keep by planning that rotation in and out very, very quick, so they don't have a lot of inventory. So it does vary. There's not one right answer on that. I can tell you this though, and Mike, I'll shut up and let you jump in on this one. I have to tell you this: there are, and here's an old rule in retail: there are no birthday parties for inventory, ever, <laughs> ever, ever, ever. That's one. That's the first rule. Go ahead, Mike. I know you have some comments. The only thing I would add, I that was a great answer, is that it also varies by season or where you are in the season. Mm -hmm. so early in the season, we're kind of building inventory for that initial rush. As we get into the heart of the season, like right now we're in October, we should be leaner than we were in September. Right, right. Sort of looks like this. Let me just draw this a little bit. So let's just say this is a chart. This is going to be really bad, Nico, but I'm going to go for it. So if you look at you look at you look at sales, and let's say the sales peak right here in the season, and then they come down. Yeah. Your inventory in new goods should be here, and as the, and as the sales go up, the inventory will slowly go up. But yeah. as it comes to this peak right here, that will be the tightest you'll have on your inventory to sales. We call those stock to sales ratios. And then at that point, that inventory is turned into cash at that point at the end of the season. That's, kind of, that's a very rough Flintstone view of what that looks like, Mike. But you see that the ratio of sales to inventory or supply demand is actually larger at the beginning of the season because you're setting the table. And then they start coming together as we enter, we go through the season. So boom, this is called cash flow and we bring it down. Love it. Uh, the only other question that we had, it was really more of a statement, but I guess there's a hidden question in there. Uh, the person is rendering themselves anonymous. They said, I have seen, oh, this is in reference to your very first slide that you showed, Paul, with the women's top slide. They said they've seen store owners downplay this situation because number one, cash is not a problem for them. Number two, they would rather have it than not have it in uh, specialty MDSE. And number three, there is no tax liabilities for the excess inventory. Number three is the one. Is that true? Well, I mean, I don't even know where to begin on that. So um, number one, if they have the cash and, you know, I, I called on a retailer. But I'm an old guy. I'm older than Mike, by the way. And I'm so old that when Nico was a little boy, he used to sit on my lap and I'd tell him retail stories. But I remember back in the 80s, I was in northern Wisconsin in a town called Rhinelander, Wisconsin, and there was a guy there named Speck DeBalm, and he used his name. And he had DeBalm's department store. They were huge at the time. And I walked into his store, and I talked to Speck. He was a tough guy. And he said, you know what? See that when you drove into Rhinelander, did you see that lumber yard on the outside of town? And this, you know what the name of that lumber yard was? And I go, it was called DeBalm's Lumber Yard. Did you see that over there? And he said, he owned half the town. And he goes, you know what? I know I have too much inventory in here, but I can afford it and I don't care. The store closed about 10 years later, went out of business. It is beyond folly to think that old inventory, something that the customers have clearly stated they are not interested in buying from you, to think it's a good idea to hold on to that inventory, that is clearly wrong. That, uh, that there is no benefit whatsoever to that 
None. And so, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be a style. It could be if you're a women's store and you don't sell size zero, well, we're going to carry a bunch of size zeros because one day that person's going to come in. Your business is to inventory based on what the customers want, not what they don't want. And you are limiting your ability to grow your business by doing that. The customers make decisions and make and they make judgments when they walk into a store. And they, when they walk into a new store, they make a judgment on whether that store is right for them. Why do you think Walmart has 50 cent soda pops at the beginning at the front of all their locations? Because that's telling the customer, look how cheap soda is in our store. Everything else is going to be cheap too. When they walk in, they make a decision. And when they see inventory that's dated, that's old, that's broken, that's been tried on, then they all immediately say, this is not a serious retailer. You are not benefiting your business by doing that. And in terms of the taxation policy, inventory is not tax. In some states, it is. Mike Taylor actually did a study where on certain states, I think there were, Mike said, 14 states that actually had a state tax. It was minimal, like 1%. It was not a big deal. One state but, went up to 8%. Okay, well, but but the real issue with inventory is how profits are calculated from accounting gap accounting principles. And accounting gap accounting principles, profits are calculated by how much inventory you have at the beginning of your year and how much you count at the end. And if you are slowly accumulating inventory faster than your sales are going up, then you are increasing your tax liability to the federal government. That's just math. That's not a that's not an opinion. And so if, you're, if you feel that you want to pay more taxes, then, then you should, then go ahead and keep doing that. But that is, there is a liability to accumulating inventory faster than sales growth. So Boy, I got, you know what? I feel a lot better, Mike. I got that out of my system. <laughs> Final question here before we, we let everyone go here. Monica's asking, yes, they, they understand too much inventory is damaging the cash flow. So what is a good plan to reduce already existing old inventory? And I know, Paul, you have a good analogy for taking it in the back. Sales in the stores distract customers from new incoming inventory. We've actually done a, a few sessions on this, um, but quick answer on that one, Paul or Mike. Uh, I'll jump in. So, yeah, I, do have very, I have a strong opinion on this, and it is taking it to the back of the store, by the way, and uh, shooting it in the head. Um, look business, and I don't care if you're a ski shop, you're a shoe store, you're a children's store, you're a fashion women's store, a men's store, you're a, a bookstore, it doesn't matter. A hardware store, old inventory is a major problem. And the faster you get out of older inventory, the better off you're going to be. Thus, the idea that you're going to try to milk margin and profits out of bad inventory is a fool's errand because it makes it worse. What you should do is take an aggressive markdown and get it off the floor and get the cash back into your checking account so that you can buy something else that'll sell better. Markdowns are not a zero-sum game. If, if you were to mark something down and then that was it the end of the year, and then so you'd have to live with the profits of that one item, of course it would be a huge problem. But that's not the way your business works. You're replacing that with something that will sell better. And if you want to avoid having a sale image, then take an aggressive markdown and let those let that, that that bad inventory be gone quickly. I know it's painful. Every markdown is painful. It is a cost to your business. It increases your cost of goods sold. But every markdown you take that is painful is a learning experience. Why did this not sell? And don't make that mistake again. Because I think Mike, I, was it Einstein that said doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. Markdowns are should be taken aggressively and be gone right away. If you try to milk margin out of it, you're going to end up with half the floor on markdowns. You'll develop a sale image, and you'll have the biggest horror story that's in retail, which are tags that started out 180, 159, 139, 119, 99, 40. I mean, it's the worst. And you're still and you're trying to find the magic price that'll sell it. And by and you took six months to get it. And meanwhile, it sat lingering on this floor for six months. Mike. I turn well, you know, but if you have a good markdown and clearance philosophy and procedures and you clear that stuff out as you go, that's one thing. But if you are a person that has this big pile of really old stuff and you have a one off problem, you don't have to deal with that on the sales floor. Right. 
I mean, you can, there are other avenues to dispose of that without uh, making your store look degraded and old. I mean, you can, there are all kinds of other things you can do. That's right, right. You can have a big event or something. I mean, if you have multiple stores, the, the retailer I was talking to this morning was you're going to actually take all of their old inventory in their stores, which is a problem. They're a new client of ours, and they were going to bring it back to the warehouse and have a warehouse sale and get it off the floor of all their locations, which I thought was a really good idea. Yep. And so people I worked with uh, at the end of each season, four, five, or six retailers would get together, rent a storefront for a weekend, and everybody bring their stuff that didn't sell during the clearance and have a big blowout. Yeah, I think everybody in this call needs to understand that markdowns are not the problem. Yeah. Markdowns are a symptom of the problem. Markdowns are a solution to the problem. I often tell the stories of when Walmart and Target got overstocked a, year, a couple of years ago. I think it was in Q1 of 2022. And they and on, on their earnings report, uh, earnings call, they announced that they were very overstocked in apparel because, well, for a number of reasons, but they, they panicked. They didn't think there was going to be in the supply chain, you know, and they were, I mean, hugely overstocked to the point where the street, Wall Street, bid their stock down, and they took a big hit in terms of the valuation of their stock. Three months later, on the next earnings call at the end of the next quarter, they announced massive markdowns. They, they announced sales increases with massive markdowns that reduced the gross profit by, I think, two or three points. It was a huge hit. And guess what happened with all those terrible markdowns, which did drive sales up, all those terrible markdowns that put profits down, guess what Wall Street did then? Drove the stock price back up. Because they know that that markdowns are a solution to a problem, just as long as you don't keep making the same mistake. One of the good things about Management One as well is we have a, a pretty vast community of partners that we work with too. In the chat, I put uh, Max Retail was designed to address this exact problem. Other retailers could sell the items that you can't. And Melody, the owner at Max Retail, developed a great system for actually swapping goods back and forth between retails within, within a specific network. So I would encourage Monica, if you go to maxretail.com, that's another great way of getting rid of broken size runs, overstocked items in specific categories, et cetera. Uh, and go and ahead. Monica, it's going to hurt. Okay. I know it's going to hurt. It's painful. You're going to take a big loss, but sometimes you have to take a big loss to get a big win and just don't do it again. That's the next step. What happened? evaluate what happened. Did I buy too much? Was I too slow in taking markdowns? What ha how did I get myself into this situation? And we can help you with that, of course, and so that we'll never have to do it again. We could stay on for another 30 to 60 minutes discussing this. And you guys see, when you get retail experts in front of these numbers, how fun it is to them. I mean, I know Paul and Mike, you get excited when you find a new story in the numbers. So really this session was designed to let our clients and other retailers that haven't yet joined Management One, this information is available to you in Retail Orbit every day. For our shuttle clients, it's updated almost every day in real time. And we encourage you to go in, look at the numbers, find some of these stories for yourself, reach out to your retail expert, ask them questions. What stories are they seeing? And it's, it's a perfect conversation starter for those monthly meetings. So. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mike. Before everyone goes, I did have, I wanted to launch a quick poll for our next Accelerator series. We're interested in hearing from you. What would you like to hear us discuss? Which topics are of most interest to you? So give us a quick rating. Let us know how you liked this session and let us know what you want to hear from us in sessions to come. We love designing educational sessions for independent retailers so that you can learn more about how your data affects your business. And Paul and Mike, I'm just letting folks answer the questions here. Thank you so much for taking your time. If you have any other questions that weren't addressed in this live session, feel free and reach out to us. I, I dropped a link in the chat as well for you to reach out to Management One. And we're here to answer any and all questions. We like developing the story as it comes. There we go, I've got a few folks asking. I'll probably close it down in a, about 30 seconds here or so. A quick reminder too, December 12th, the final episode in our three-part series for the Accelerator series. And I will be sending out a registration email for folks to jump in on that one. Let me just also add to that date. Uh, that is the day after my birthday. 
So, um, so you'll nothing be extravagant to in terms of presence. Just, you know, don't embarrass me. <laughs> They'll try. I'll give it another 20 seconds. We have folks feverishly pounding the keys here. And Paul, I'm glad you found the the laser pointer that we can yes, use some of these. Proud of myself on that one. Oh, Monica. Uh, uh, sorry, I kept calling her Monica. It was Monique. I'm sorry, Monique. Uh, Monique said they did. She did connect with Max Retail. So perfect. Right. Monique is a step ahead. Catherine is asking. Uh, she said she had to miss part of this. Is there a recording available, Catherine? In about forty-five minutes after I hit the stop button, I should have a copy of the recording. And yes, we are going to distribute it to all of our registrants. So thank you for asking that. We'll and be it be on our, it'll be up on our YouTube channel, which is available to the public, and it it'll be available to all. So with that said, to all of our attendees. Thank you. I know we went over slightly. Uh, there's just always so much to cover in these sessions. It's tough to condense it down into 30 minutes. And Paul and Mike, thank you again, as always, for your time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Look forward to seeing you all Thanks, guys. in December.